Hi there, thanks for uh, tuning in to another video on my YouTube channel. Uh, this is about uh, the painting of the Naval College in Sozopol and uh, it's painted from our studio which is the White Boat Studio there. It's actually the view out of the windows. And this is me painting there. <laughs> you can join me on holiday if you like. Okay, so uh, let's make a start. Um, if you want my um, a picture of uh, this particular painting, uh, then you can um, contact me by email, which, and the uh, details are coming up on the on the screen right now. It's artstevo at gmail dot com. My watercolors for beginners ebook is free of charge, so all you need to do is send me an email. You can also see my other activities on artstevo.wordpress.com and um, we've got some special guests coming up this year um, at the studio in Sozopol so you'll be in for a treat one of which is uh, a Russian artist called Ilya Ibriev and he's coming from the 4th to the 6th of, of August uh, this year and he's doing a three day watercolour masterclass. So if you want details of that, if you just email me, whiteboatstudio at gmail.com. These are a few of my ladies at the harbour, enjoying themselves painting. The lady on the right, Tatiana, the subject of her painting left. <laughs> so she had to make it up. This is the uh, building that we're going to paint today. It's seen better days as you can see from this close up, but we're using it we'll be using a bit of artistic license. If you'd like this uh, sketch, this is my sketch, uh, just send me an email again and I'll uh, I'll get one out to you. Or you can just pause the video and copy this one. Or you can email me at whiteboatstudio at gmail.com. This is my layout for today. I'm using, a, I've set up a brand new studio and um, so it's a bit experimental at the moment. This is the first video that I've done with both sound and vision um, and I'm hoping to do Skype lessons and also some live demonstrations from the studio this year. So watch this space. You can also find others of my uh, videos on YouTube and I'm in all the usual places including Facebook, Twitter, etc etc and you can uh, like and share these videos um, and also my pages on Facebook several there's several of those so this is the layout I've pre-mixed my uh, watercolor paints um, it's important because you don't have a lot of time when you paint in hot countries so basically I'm just running through the materials I've got some brushes a palette graphite pencil and I've tested the colors on my test sheet here and it's basically a cap up mortem and a mixture of burnt umber and ultramarine and those are the basic colors and I'm going for quite a stormy sky we had quite a heavy thunderstorm yesterday and the Naval College was lit up rather nicely. So I'm looking for counter change on this painting. Um, so it's important when you draw this that the, you get the perspective right. So the higher up the building you go, the angles get slightly steeper, but they're fairly consistent throughout. So the right hand ones are always one angle and the left hand ones are always one angle and the verticals are always vertical. This is my little spray bottle that used to be a mosquito spray and I'm now preparing my paints just by giving them a quick spray with the water and that just activates them, makes it handy when you're travelling when the paints are not all uh, coming out of the box so I usually just pop it out in the sun to dry. I'll be using a one inch brush uh, to just pre-wet the area. We're going to be painting the sky wet into wet. <clears throat> So I'm just using quite gentle brush strokes. As you can see, I'm left-handed. Um, so be quite gentle with the surface, otherwise you can 
you can scuff it up excuse the reflection from the light there from above but it actually helps me to um, to see where I've been the reason that I use a flat brush when I'm painting around buildings is it makes it easier to cut around those little awkward uh, sharp 90 degree corners etc so I usually use the point of the brush quite vertically when I uh, paint away if you like I'm painting the water away from the object itself so I lift it quite high to get right in the corners and then just sweep upwards it really doesn't matter what angle you paint the the water on at this stage but it's important that you've got an overall sheen on the paper and no big uncontrollable puddles which uh, <laughs> that's the thing that causes the panic in in watercolor painting so you just want a nice even sheen and as you may see in a couple of minutes I'm going to have to go back over some of these areas because where you start will have uh, started to dry there's something in watercolour painting called the golden time and basically you shouldn't carry on painting if the paper's lost its shine so the worst thing we can do now is to start painting what, uh, what, when, there's, when the shine start to go off the paper because you just end up with a muddy painting so it's surprisingly quick and it depends on how wet you paint, how thick the paper is and the temperature and humidity of the location when you're painting. So the golden time can be as little as seconds if you're painting in full sun and if it's a fairly cold day in England it might be 10 minutes but in, in the countries that I paint in which is Bulgaria, Greece and in Asia it can literally be two or three minutes. So you're working against the clock. So the whole of this stormy sky is going to be painted, as you'll see. If you look at the clock now, we're on about seven minutes. Um, it should only take a few minutes. And if you continue to paint after that, everything just turns to mud and the basic uh, the, the painting will be uh, pretty much ruined. So now I'm just mixing up and just making sure that my paint's ready. I've tested it already on a strip, but I wiped my brush on the... Um, cloth uh, first if you don't do that what happens is you've already wet the uh, the paper so that's going to weaken the mix anyway and if you then don't wipe your brush on the cloth all it means then is that you um, that you continue to weaken that mix and watercolor paint always dries lighter anyway so you can overcompensate by being quite strong and dark with the colors it's surprising how strong and dark it is and the washes look uneven at this stage. You can see I'm using quite gentle brush strokes, about 45 degrees. Um, this was about a quarter sheet painting on Bockingford paper. And uh, I wish I'd have chosen a bigger brush to do this bit because, uh, yeah, uh, anyway, such is life. <laughs> so now I'm cutting quite carefully around the, build, uh, around the buildings there. I appreciate the, I'm trying to fit everything on one screen so you can see the mixing, the brushes and the paintings and I may attach a second camera for future videos just to get some close-ups of what's happening up close and personal um, I realise when I watch this that it's, uh, it's quite a long way off but basically I'm just painting down to the buildings down to where the trees are going to be and if I'm painting up against something hard like a building I'm going to leave it with a hard edge so the water actually stops the reason that we went quite carefully around the building is that uh, the paint actually stops running where the water stops so if you want if you have an, a hard edge then you can um, literally just paint that and leave it to dry but if you've got a soft edge so on the bottom right of this painting uh, the building is obliterated by trees so you'll see in a second that I'll soften those edges and so you in effect painting reverse painting around those trees so you're leaving the the gaps that the trees are going to take um, um, so that it's got a nice soft kind of fluffy edge I'm checking now that they that they uh, still shiny and I'm tipping the board I want the light on this painting to come from the top left so I'm tipping the board so that any rays of sunlight uh, will go come in that direction and I'm helping it now with a little spray of water which is it breathes a bit of life in the into the painting but I'm careful not to spray the bottom where it meets the building otherwise it will dribble on the building 
when you're happy with the results then you can sit the board flat the two areas on the uh, left in the sky are just the reflections of the light but you can see how this 300 gram paper has buckled and that's quite normal for this weight of paper uh, there's no buckling at all if you use a very heavy paper but there will be some buckling but as long as you control the washes during that stage then you won't you won't end up with a, a stripy painting you can see now that i just wiped the, the brush on my hand um, to make sure that it's quite flat so i wet the brush squeeze it out between my fingers and then I, in a sliding motion i actually wiped it on the the heel of my hand which is the flattest part of your hand and all i'm doing there is lifting out uh, the shape of the building where i was a little clumsy and um went over the building i'm not nobody's perfect are they <laughs> so now i'm just tipping it just to help it to move a little bit um if you wash looks patchy at this stage then as you can see so does mine and they do settle down so all the colors blend together but when you ha when you're happy with the result of the sky then lay it flat and what will happen is as you tip the board up a bead collects on the bottom of the wash so you've got to keep an eye on that because that can be your friend or it can also be your enemy if it runs down into the rest of the painting so all i'm doing now with a they call it using a thirsty brush so it's a brush that's been washed out right to the bottom of the pot and then it's squeezed between my fingers and then just finally wiped on a cloth to take any moisture out of it and the capillary action is um, will lift up any puddles of water or paint that are there um, because if you don't you can get back runs as a result what they call cauliflowers in the trade and uh, i'm just lifting out a little bit of uh, the sky here just with a brush there's a couple of ways of lifting clouds out uh, the more subtle way is to use a brush or you, you can you'll see in a minute that i actually use tissue um, and sometimes in the sky that combination of a hard edge that you get with a tissue and a soft edge that you get with a brush gives you quite a no nice combination of skies so here we are with a toilet roll um, it's better if it doesn't have a colour on it or a pattern uh, and all you basically do is scrunch it up into a ball and then just dab and the harder you dab the whiter the cloud will be I'm also wiping around the edge of the painting if you don't do that the, the paint can bleed back basically the the paper is expanding now because we, we wet it and when it dries it dries flat and if it dries flat and there is some surplus paint on the on the masking tape around the outside it'll bleed back in causing a hard edge around your painting um, so it's best if you can avoid that so now I'm quite happy with the results and uh, we just need to let that dry always a temptation to keep on fiddling the important thing when you do clouds is to make sure that you keep changing the shape of that tissue if you don't then you end up with cotton wool clouds that are all exactly the same shape and I don't think anybody's ever seen two clouds that are exactly the same shape so it just looks uh, false the worst thing you can do with the painting at this stage is to continue fiddling with it it's quite funny when I'm teaching particularly beginners uh, they don't really understand um, that if you continue to fiddle all that happens is that the um, um, it goes muddy so the worst thing you can do is to carry on when really you should stop and it's really tempting to keep saying to yourself oh I just wish I'd done this and oh I, that, I wish that was a little bit better and I'll just change this but the best thing you can do all these changes can be made in watercolour painting um, but it's better to let it dry and then attempt to correct them um, the worst thing you can do is to fiddle so uh, I always encourage students not to do that but it's very tempting I even find myself doing it sometimes I always make sure I wash my brushes out and leave them in that pot with the bristles on downwards and then if you leave brushes either in a jar stood upright or with the bristles upwards um, it causes the paint to um, peel off the handles which is annoying when you 
working on a painting and the paint's flaking off and going on your painting. I'm just mopping up a little bit of the bead there on the edge. And I would, before I did that, I would have checked to make sure that there was still a shine. You can still work on areas of the painting that are shiny uh, and it will vary depend, depending on how wet you painted an area and also where you started to apply both the water and the paint. So if it the, the golden rule is if it's shiny it's okay and if it's not it's not. I'm just pointing out here that I'm looking for counter change here. I wanted to make sure that the sky was darker on the left than it was on the right hand side because the sunny side of this building is on the left hand side and the dark side will be on the right hand side. So you get, in effect, two lots of counter change, which is basically the contrast, the lightest thing against the darkest thing in a painting. So we've got the dark sky on the left of the building and that'll be contrasted against the light part of the building and the opposite on the other side. So the dark side of the building against the lighter part of the sky. But it also looks quite natural. It kind of, that slope leads the eye to the building and the whole point of this painting is to put emphasis on this uh, beautiful old but neglected building so now I'm just activating some burnt umber and some um, ultramarine blue which is a great combination of colours for your shadows um, I never use black in my paintings um, I prefer to mix up a really dark with burnt umber and also ultramarine I'm also a great lover of a colour called Caput Mortem. These colours that I'm using are tube, tube colours, artist quality, from Tintoretto in Italy. And uh, I use those exclusively now. Although there are some limitations with some of the colours, but I managed to deal direct with the manufacturer in Italy. And as I hadn't tried some of the colours, I just had the opportunity to buy all 48. So I took that opportunity, even though I own it. I know you only need three colours to uh, the primary colours to paint any colour, uh, but it's always nice to experiment with new colours. But some of them, some of the properties are not as expected. Things that on the literature are marked as transparent colours are not, and ones that are opaque are not. So you've got to experiment. In fact, on another video, I think I've, you'll see my homemade colour card that I make um, every time I try any new colours. Um, it's just more natural than either something that you get off the internet or um, or something that you've um, got from an art shop. The colours are never accurate and they're never accurate on the tubes either. So you're as well just to make your own, make your own colour cards up and then uh, it's all good to go. Um, okay, now what I'm doing is I'm painting the dark side of the building everything is dry now in the painting if I wanted some bleeding into the sky then I would carry on painting the building once it's um, once it's um, when it's still moist the sky but obviously I want a nice crisp edge here so off camera I've dried this painting with a hairdryer on slow speed if you uh, if you don't dry it on slow speed, you'll find that sometimes the tape can lift off. So it's as well to do it nice and gently and try and stay away from the tape. I've focused in now. Sorry, I've um, zoomed in now, but the focus isn't great. I must play around with the settings on this camera. Um, but basically what I'm doing is I'm I'm blocking in these, these shapes on the shadow side of this building. And as you may be able to see, I'm just leaving the light portion at the top of each of those where the sun might be catching them. Um, so I'm just blocking these in now and I'm, I'm painting around the windows. I'm also using a little bit of natural sea sponge there um, just to vary that mix. You do get a nice combination of granulation from uh, this combination of darks and also caput mortem but it's, it's, all, it's also nice just to lift a little bit out because a dark can look almost too dark and too stark. So it just gives a little bit of uh, a little bit of detail there. It's at this point that really um, I wish I'd have had another camera set up for the close-ups. 
you'll see now that what I'm doing is just to try and get some texture on this building. You saw from the photograph at the very beginning that the, there's a lot of decay on this building and to portray that, uh, just flicking with a toothbrush with clean water um, is a great way of getting texture. You can see sometimes the spatter is um, a, a little uncontrollable and where it had bled on the outside of the building there I just uh, mopped it up with some tissue. There's another trick as well, if you, you can actually make a mask the shape of the outside of the building and then just lay the mask on when you're spattering either with colour or with water and it stops it splashing into your sky area. So I've just got down to the bottom of the windows now. Still working on the, the dark side of this building. And you can see how the dark contrasting side of the building the dark side Luke is contrasting nicely with nobody ever used to laugh at that joke on YouTube I'm not sure that anybody even understood it it amused me though immensely so I'm working on the dark side now and it's um, it's contrasting ni nicely with the light sky behind and that was the that was the original plan that the counter change at this side of the building would be would be quite stark and contrasting the title of the painting is actually called Old and New, I think, or is it New and Old? Uh, but basically, it's a very neglected building which breaks my heart. But every year, in at this time of year in May, there's beautiful blooms come on the fruit trees over on the island. <clears throat> and um, it's a very beautiful combination of new growth and, and an old building. And that's what I was trying to portray in this painting. It's one of my favourite buildings in Sozopol and um, it's uh, it may be neglected and it may fall down uh, so I feel duty bound to kind of record it. Down at the bottom of the building here is where it's going to meet those trees so um, you'll see in a second when I reach that area that I'll soften those edges and basically that's the tops of the trees. Yeah I'm just using a wet brush there can you see? and I'm just softening those hard edges. Basically, if you want a hard edge, you leave it just, just painted, and if you want a soft edge, you just use a slightly moist brush and just spread the paint around and it continues to bleed into the moist area and it'll just soften that edge. And you can see now, before I move on to the next section, I'm using the hairdryer. Thankfully, I'm doing a separate audio for this so you don't have to listen to the sound of a hairdryer which could be very annoying indeed I know it is when I watch other people's videos so I'm painting it on slow there just concentrating on those areas that I want to be completely dry before I start painting the next section and you can see now how the building's standing out this is just the first wash and here's how it looks out of focus <laughs> Now I'm continuing with the, some of the darks on this front edge. There's, uh, the masonry steps out in places. So even though it's the sunny side of this building on the left hand side, there is still some shadows because the masonry kind of steps out um, to give that tiered effect to this tower, which was a former naval college and fisherman's college. And they used to keep their arms here in the, the bad old days of the Cold War. So I'm painting quite carefully around these sections now. And you can see now we're trying to get, starting to get a, a three dimensional look to this building. I'm also conscious that the uh, it's a, originally it was a white painted building, but it's no longer white because the, uh, the masonry is falling off. I've also just turned the board over there because it's easier for me uh, to paint that way and it's easier to drag a brush towards you than it is to push it away and I'm also conscious of a left hander that I usually end up rubbing the painting with the back of my left hand so uh, just turn your board in, in whatever way is uh, convenient and comfortable for you so I'm just adding some detail now using a small flat brush 
I know there is an adage that you should never use a, sm a flat brush in watercolour painting or in any painting, but I don't, I don't agree with that. I usually use round brushes for organic things like trees and skies, but I usually use a combination of those brushes and flat brushes for buildings. There's nothing quite to give you the sharpness of a window by using the corner of a small flat brush. Uh, you can use a rigger, but it's quite difficult to do. So this is how the building's looking now. You can see I've left the whites. So I've painted the darks of the window panes on that left hand side, but I've also just left a few whites where the separate window panes are. Now I'm pre-wetting this area now just with clean water because I want to indicate stains of uh, rust and also uh, decay. The, the plaster's fallen off this building and it's revealing the um, and it's revealing the brickwork underneath. So I'm just flicking with the toothbrush some colour in there. Um, and that little trick is if you, if you paint something and you don't like it, just rub it with your finger. Now we're moving on to the uh, exciting part, which is one of my favourite subject matters, which is painting uh, rust. And here I'm just um, going to show you what happens with these inks when they get sprayed with water. These Sennelier inks come, um, they're French inks and they come in a huge range of colours. And uh, they also come with a dropper, which means that you don't necessarily have to use either an ink pen or sticks or a brush um, and you don't have to contaminate any of those tools of your trade but the lovely thing about them is that when you spray them with water they really come alive on a painting I'll be using some dip pens and I'm going to try and portray the rust in these colours my two favourite colours in this range are Bisc and Walnut and I'll show you which they are once I've sprayed it with water this was a technique I got from an Australian artist called John Lovett and it's a uh, it's a great way of incorporating ink into your watercolour uh, paintings so I guess that makes them mixed media in the eyes of the purists yeah the two centre ones are the two favourite colours the left one is uh, walnut and the right one is bisque so I'll be using a combination of probably all four of these just to portray the, the different colours of the the rust on the building the important thing when you're painting like this with ink is the ink will dry shiny. Um, so if you leave a puddle of ink on your watercolour painting, it will dry shiny. Um, and you'll see how, when I spread that out that it um, those are the that does show you the the real colours of them. Um, so if you don't dab, so the best thing to do is when you're painting with ink is to make sure that you have some tissue standing by and then if anything unexpected happens as it can because what we're going to do in a second is just spray this area with water um, with uh, sorry not spray using a brush here we are so I'm just going to brush those areas and I'm going to use a combination of paint and ink to portray the, both the bricks and the the rusty metal that's, bit, that's exposed now just off camera there I'm using a very weak mix of English red and burnt sienna just to give the, uh, the kind of warmth of the bricks even though most of the painting was originally white and I'm sure it looked stunning on the day it was done um, but now it's, uh, it's a little bit uh, faded so you may be able to see this in, uh, in close up shortly so I'm just dabbing on if you use the side of the brush you get a completely random effect than if you were to um, just use the tip of the brush doing all this brickwork um, is quite laborious and I think shortly I uh, I turn the camera off just so that I can I can crack on but basically the lights coming from the right and all you're doing is really painting the shadows so when you do the windows you're painting the tops and lefts in shadow and leaving the white paper to portray the, the white of the building which I'm going to age extensively using ink and the and the terracotta colours um, 
for the exposed brickwork. And everywhere that I come, I paint this building, and I come down to an, an area where there are trees, then I'll soften those edges. I'm using a dip pen here. I don't often use these, so apparently the, the nibs get better with age, uh, but I find them all a bit problematic. They either blob uncontrollably or not give you a smooth, fine line. Um, I've got a Lamy pen that um, that is better at it than these dip pens, but uh, I thought I'd give it a whirl for the video. You can just see me dab an area there where it, the the ink had blobbed from the from the ink uh, pen, and uh, the reason I dabbed it with tissue was to just stop it drying in a puddle because you've only literally got a few minutes with these and most other types of inks um, in which to work. So now I'm just trying to indicate some random um, stripes where they the metal showing through the concrete and I'm just trying to build this up without losing the freshness of the what was a white building. So I'm just working on these areas now trying to make the Naval College as realistic as I can and um, I'm just going to move this microphone a little closer so it might increase the volume a little bit. Okay so I'm just closing in there just so you can see the effects of this ink and the terracotta coloured paints that I've been using. Because we wet the paper first, we've got a little bit of time and what happens is you get all those feathery lines from the ink when it hits an area that's damp. So it's a little bit uncontrollable because you never really know what's going to happen. But that much, that's what makes it fun. So again, the golden time still applies. Um, if you paint with a with ink on a pen like I'm doing, um, it means that the if it's wet you get a spidery line, but if it's dry you get quite a hard line. And then then it's a nice combination to use on your paintings if you get a combination of things that are spidery and things that are not. So uh, I'm just working my way around now. And trying to uh, make it look like an old building as you can see we've still got uh, the light area of the building even though we've we've put some paint on there it's important that it's not too dark on the light side of the building because otherwise there's no contrast in the building so it needs to be colored but not so colored that it looks a similar tonal value to the shadow side of the building so I'm just uh, working my way around here just pre-wet in that area and then I'll add some uh, I'll add some ink to it so now I'm just working my way around this uh, building and you can see I've cut to um, the area where I've completed the rest of the windows and just using the terracotta colors for the tiles and the darks and the same techniques as I used on the turret of the building to um, to add some wear and tear just with the terracotta and the pen and ink and now I'm preparing the beautiful colour for those um, blossoms on the island and I'm using a combination of a couple of lilacs and a pink here and I want a couple of shades I want a light shade for the light side so the light side of these trees <clears throat> is towards the left and the dark colour is going to be used on the right hand side so I'll just work my way along in sections you've got the same kind of time as before two or three four minutes maybe to do each section so it's as well not to do a massive section at a time now I'm left-handed so I usually paint from right to left as you may have noticed in everything that I painted both the sky and also the building and now for the trees so I'm preparing my brushes they just get um, dropped into the water squished out right to the bottom of the pot and the water pots that I use have got a sponge in the bottom so you can really bang 
and get all the paint out of the stocks. And these, um, as John Lovett would say, Raphael bristle rashes um, are bashed around a bit. Now, I would never do these with my best brushes, but uh, I use a combination of fan brushes here, which I bought from a local supermarket. I think I got a set of four. And then just rough bristle, bristle brushes, which I buy from the local DIY store. So um, you can see I'm using my hand as a shield here. I'm just trying to spray it with loose droplets of water. Um, I don't want all areas to be dry, uh, give dry edges, and I don't want them all to be wet either. Otherwise, it'll just end up being fuzzy. So I want a nice combination of, um, of uh, wet and dry edges. I start by painting mainly in, I think it's cap and mortem and burn timber there and just use a flicking motion upwards from uh, bottom to top for the boughs of the trees. If you paint in that direction, what happens is you, you naturally lift the brush off at the, at the top of the stroke and that looks convincing because tree boughs are usually always, <laughs> nearly always, wider at the bottom than they are at the top. So if you paint in an upward direction, um, it always looks convincing. And I just mopped the bottom of the trees there with a little bit of um, uh, natural sea sponge, which is what I use when I'm uh, doing lifting off these techniques. So now I'm bashing my brush around. You can be as brutal as you want with that. And I'm using quite strong paint and I'm actually let, letting it mix on the paper there. So if this was a, the blossom of the tree up against the Naval College, then it would have a light side on the left and a dark side on the right. So as you can see now, the things that are pointing towards the light, I'm painting quite lightly. And then what I'll do is I'll strengthen the mix. Uh, so there I go, I'm just mixing a bit more paint in it. And now I'm gonna to go to the right hand side and just drop some darker color in there. And just let the two things bleed together. Now try not to do too big an area. Uh, so pick one or two or three trees whatever you can manage and I'm just softening these and blending them together with a with a little bit of sea sponge on the paper and just let them bleed this is the beauty of watercolour painting when the unexpected things happen we call them happy accidents and it's best to try and encourage those now obviously to get some distance in this painting under normal circumstances there would be quite a number of planes in when I say planes, I mean the layers of a painting that give distance to it and to give recession is the technical phrase for it. In this painting, however, we've only got three. We've got the nearest thing to our eyes, which is the, the trees that I'm painting now. Then we've got the Naval College in the mid distance. And then finally, we've got the sky. So it's important that each time you paint each one of those sections um, and usually in watercolour painting it's painting from light to dark and from back to front so the sky that's why the sky was painted first then the naval college and now the trees so there's not a lot of opportunity for recession or distance in this painting and in fact there isn't a lot of distance between the trees and the naval college because they're, they're right up against it anyway um, so j just to give you some idea of how to get distance in your paintings so the idea for the painting is to um, to have a nice crisp edge against the Naval College, which will throw the Naval College back a little way, and also around the bottoms of each side of the painting. I'm hoping to uh, achieve a kind of vignette look, almost like wedding photography, where it blurs towards the outside edges. I'm just pointing out there that the light still is coming from the left-hand side. So if you only th if you paint an object and only think about where the light is, it's, it's very easy to, um, to get that right. And the reason that I put an arrow in the, on the border of, my, of each painting is, and again, depending on how complex the subject is, but if you're doing a very complex, say, um, townscape with lots of roofs, chimneys, gable ends, it's really easy just to forget where the light's coming from. So the arrow on the border just reminds you constantly that the light's coming from, in this painting, the, the left-hand side. You can see with that close-up there, I'd also taken the opportunity to uh, 
to draw I actually used an ink pen and even a ruler uh, for some of those um, cables that are holding the aerials up it used to be um, a listening station so there's quite a lot of antennas and things on the top of the building so they're just painted with a combination of a white pen and a black pen and I try and use a broken line so it looks um, more natural I could have used a rigger or I could have used a, a sword liner which was the brush that I used for those trees at the moment I'm just using a yeah I think it's a rigger now it's actually a nail art brush I don't know why I ended up with that in my kit but I did but it's one of the brushes I use most often that and my inch and a half flat brush so now I'm just trying to work out where the darks and the lights would be on each of these trees and I always try to vary the colour from one side of the painting to the other but also um, if you paint in trees the, the, there's an, an infinite variety of, um, of different colours of the same even of the same um, plant species or flower so um, it's always nice to be able to just mix that up a little bit and just change the colour and it makes the painting more interesting and, and engaging so the technique I'm using here is just little squiggles of kind of random colour uh, the overall idea is when you paint trees like this make sure that they're all individual each tree is uh, one tree and then it's neighbours next, next to it it's not one mass of, of trees the other thing to try and avoid is that when you do up to a building like this vary the line don't make it come down so that's the line of the top of the trees don't make it come down in a straight even line because it wouldn't be like that some trees will be taller than others so try and get a random effect you can see at the bottom of that tower on the right hand side which I um, which I corrected later on I'd not gone far enough over the the naval college with that tree and you'll see towards the end at the when I show the final finished painting um, that I actually went went in and corrected that because it, it does look a bit strange because there's a lot more building behind there and roofs and things going on so now you can see the overall look and again I'm painting some boughs to these trees um, I use these dishes quite extensively uh, the dishes mean that your colours stay quite pure um, and a palette uh, will kind of collect the um, the compound colours I guess that are in the in the bottom when you mix a few but I started with bowls so it's a hard habit to give up this is the therapeutic time for the painting um, in general when you start the painting you start off with the big brushes the big washes and then as you try and define the the subject matter as you try and give the painting a focal point which in this case is where those trees contrast against this whole building um, it's always nice to be able to um, just vary those colours and just to make sure that you get that strength of colour it's actually the darks that make the lights work and I'm just spraying the bottom of these trees just give them a, a little bit more life I'm now mixing up some greens um, with a combination of I think those are green straight from the tube which I rarely use um, but there is a nice sap green in there that gives a nice dark so I'm going to add these um, leaves in, in, in amongst these blossoms now using the same rough bristle brush and just using a dabbing motion when you use this technique it's always important if you get one brush stroke and then you repeat that same brush stroke you get trees that are exactly the same form and they never are so the, be the best thing to do is to just twist the brush around or swap to a different brush um, I guess the rule is if you see a pattern emerging change something but don't carry on otherwise you'll end up with um, very regular trees so basically now the greens are mixing with the lilacs on the paper there again the, water, the uh, paper's still shiny so you can continue to work on it uh, painting, I'm painting this area quite wet as well so it's, um, 
it's going to stay moist for quite some time so I'm just working my way around I'm trying to make sure that the the bottom edge isn't even or straight or regular I'm trying to make sure that that's quite random because very shortly I'll be washing the the darks um, with some clean water on a brush and just softening some of those edges it's nice if you don't soften them all um, otherwise it, it can look uh, a little bit dreamy it's quite nice for doing misty effects though so uh, just preparing now with some darks so we started off with the light colours which were the lilac colours and then I've used the green to intersperse between those and now I'm adding the darks so where your tree shapes emerge just paint a dark now using I think this one is Caput Mortem which is one of my favourite darks you can also mix that with between ultramarine blue and vermilion uh, because not every manufacturer does that particular colour in their range so I'm just working my way through that now you'll see that I keep switching brushes and also just twisting the brush in a different direction just trying to avoid any repetition because repetition isn't often seen in nature and now I'm, wa I'm wetting the bottom of some of those trees just with that moist sea sponge to try and uh, encourage the paint to flow towards the bottom of the painting it will all be right to the bottom of the frame that's not the intention um, but just to soften some edges and that really gives you a lead into the uh, the focal point of the painting which is the Naval College and those lovely coloured trees just splashing with water there from a toothbrush gives you some back runs you can also use it's a, a textural technique that I use quite often either by spraying with paint or with water you've just got to be stand by with a tissue because there's a chance that you uh, you might splash the sky area so um, you know one of the myths about watercolour painting is you can't correct mistakes and of course you can so I'm just spraying those to encourage back runs Just checking the, how wet the paper is still to work on obviously the more you do lifting off the drier the paper goes so the less time you've got This is so therapeutic that I nearly dropped off there and pressed the wrong button. <laughs> I hope you're finding this as relaxing as I am doing the audio. <laughs> Thankfully, I didn't fall asleep during the uh, during the period when I was painting it. <laughs> that was a very strange moment. I think we'll call that one a senior moment. So we're coming towards the end now. And uh, you can see I'm just softening off these areas to get that vignette effect. You can also scratch some boughs in the trees uh, just with the end of a sharpened stick or a brush. And, and I'm just defining these edges so the paint is getting darker as, as we move into the foreground. <clears throat> Basically, when you start the painting, I'm usually stood up to do the big washes. So the, the big washes get done stood up uh, with, with the big brushes and the big washes. And then as you refine towards the focal point in the painting, the paint gets darker and the brushes get smaller and smaller and smaller and that's where you get this lovely definition between the sharpness of the detail in the foreground and the softness say in the sky I also added a few uh, seagulls and uh, things like that in the sky um, I love to see seagulls when they're um, sunlit against a, a dark sky so in the finished painting 
you may notice that there are two or three white uh, seagulls there uh, flying in the in the sky against those really dark clouds and it's one of the my favorite things to paint you also notice the area in the top um, so we're about finished now and uh, that's about it I think so thank you for tuning in and um, I hope to see you again keep checking back thank you bye